Incorporating regular exercise as a part of a daily routine is one of the first steps to living an extraordinary life. And as you add these workouts into your lifestyle, the inevitable soreness and fatigue is sure to set in. The more I learn about the importance of exercise, the more I have grown to appreciate the importance of recovery as well. From improved sleep patterns to massage rollers, allowing the body to recover is just as important as exercise itself. The repairing process allows you not just to rest, but to rebuild, stronger than before. And the quicker we recover, the quicker we rebuild. That's where Robbie Jenkins comes in. Partnering with David Johnson and his wife Bailey, Rapid Reboot was born in 2016. This pneumatic compression system draws lactic acid from muscles, helping athletes recover from intense workouts. Similar to the compression boots found in hospitals used to avoid blood clots in patients, this professional recovery system takes that concept to a whole new level. Now with attachments for arms and hips, Rapid Reboot allows athletes to train longer and at higher intensity, but most importantly, it helps them recover better and faster. The competitive edge athletes gain from this system is enough to make it a remarkable product. But as an end user, I can tell you for me personally, that's not even the best part. For me, the time spent in the boots is one of the best parts of my day. It's not just recovery, it's relaxation. I look forward to that time to unwind, read, or even take a quick nap. Most active recovery systems require effort or an extra set of hands to be effective. With Rapid Reboot, all the active recovery work is done for you, while you still get to remain inactive, just like a massage. In part one of our conversation, Robbie and I discuss all of this and how the company is rebooting the recovery space as a whole. Learn how they bootstrapped the business from day one, taking big risks and changing the recovery market in the process. The second half of the interview has some exciting news that we will release along with the company's big announcement coming soon. So stay tuned up and tune in to my conversation with Robbie Jenkins. It's a trade yeah, show, yeah, but it's yeah. it's huge. And basically, like if you've ever been on like Alibaba or Made in China and you've looked for parts or, or mm -hmm. even like completed products, you know, there's listing after listing of a lot of things that look the same because, right. you know, just the way IP. It's stock art. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, because it's stock art or, or it's like you have these factories that like someone comes out with a product or like something becomes hot and they all take it and they just replicate it, right? right. Like exactly, engineer. they reverse engineer, they re replicate it, so you can have the same like hoverboard. Like the cool thing about the Canton Fair is, it's basically the real version of that digital. I mean, there's aisles and aisles and aisles of factories that do the same thing, but you get to talk to them about customizing it. What are their capabilities? The you know, they're going to yeah. show you. The, a lot of them will show pictures of what the factory looks like. You can ask them like, what kind of equipment do you have? They can showcase like different things that they can do to customize it, talk about, you know, do you have engineers we could work with to, to change up if it's something more mechanical or techy? You know, a lot of times, like for soft goods or bags. So um, I went out this a couple years ago. There are entire showrooms. I mean, the scale of the camp fair is just like unfathomable. It's, mm. it's like the size of several hundred super Walmarts put together huge building after huge building with huge floor trade shows aisle after aisle after aisle I mean it would take it would take years to walk the whole thing really and they do it in different phases so you know where your specific niche is and you yeah so you can area. find like okay soft goods bags and it's just you know, hours and hours of walking through looking at like okay well these are nice what what kind of how much would this one cost and you get to see like what kind of capabilities they have so we found a really nice bag factory and we said hey we want to work with you. How much would this bag cost? So you kind of get a reference of, for that quality. And the bags are just so that you can carry the product around, essentially. Yeah. So we, so we found the factory that we wanted to work with through the Canton Fair, 
And then Bailey and I actually went out and we worked with them on prototypes and we sat in their design area in their factory. And, no kidding. And we went through the drawings and they had some samples done when we were, when we arrived. And they shipped samples to us and okay, change this, change that, change this. And then it's like, okay, bam, it's perfect. And then they, you know, they give you a quote and, and they start cranking away at it. So a lot of things are like that. You know, you find, and you've been able to have good results with them coming out the right yeah. way. Yeah. I mean, point. you can, for smaller things, like, we're going to have a microfiber cloth that comes in the packaging, right? Right, right, right. So something like that, I just, I looked online. You know, there's a million places yeah. that do a microfiber cloth. It's like, okay, that that looks pretty good quality. You know, the price is kind of right. And I, I messaged a few of them and said, hey, can you send me a sample? And whoever had, like, the closest green, you know, to right, the file to the, that I sent them, yeah. you know. Okay, the green's right. The printing's right. The texture's the right. The texture's <laughs> right. Thickness. The price is right. Bam, okay. And I, I've never met them in person or talked to them other than, like, through email or, That's like, trip. or WeChat or something like that. Yeah. It's not as hard as you would think, but there's definitely this this time of familiarizing yourself with, okay, what are they expecting from me? Because you, you right. have to spell everything, especially if it's something new or, like, even... Like uh, the boxes that we ship in, there's black on black. There's like black gloss on black matte. Right. I mean, you go to a Chinese factory, say we want black on black, and they're like, "Wait, what? Yeah, you can't see compute, it." Right. We're like, "No, this, this is going to be glossy black, and this is going to be matte black." And they're like, "Yeah, but it's hard to see." And it's like, "Yeah, that's exactly that's the point. That's the point. <laughs> I want it black on black because it's cool." And they're like, "Why?" And they don't understand right, why it's right. not white on black or bl- you know black on white or you know yeah, or great. like for them like why not use Orange and yellow, those like, you know, <laughs> right? They're just there's no comprehension of that. that yeah, crossover. so like the the design side, like it has to be spelled out. Yeah. About the capabilities of what they can do from a product standpoint are just it's amazing to see. It like, is right. Some of these factories, you go in their showrooms where they show like different products they've done for different companies, and you're like, I didn't even think, I didn't even know you could do that with like it's something as simple as a box, right? Um, like our our packaging factory, really cool. They they do awesome stuff and like we come up with the design here you know send it out and they and, you know they do a sample but then I go out there like Bailey and I went out there yeah and you see all these other ways you can and do you're it. like oh my gosh I wish like we could have done that you know like you have this <laughs> box that like folds this weird way or it's got all these yeah. different textures and it's you know it's got like plush turns into origami or yeah, something like, oh, yeah. oh my goodness I didn't even know <laughs> you know knew, it's right? like the box is like more expensive than the product it seems you know but again so getting cool. out there and getting those face to faces you get to see and find out new ways that you can be different and differentiate yourself in the marketplace yeah and sure. you can you can use places like Alibaba like Made in China yeah. some of those to start conversations with with that's factories that's kind of my initial approach for some of the stuff I was trying to do it's really nice and then once you cool. start establishing friendships it's I mean we are packaging uh, factory there's a guy there Frank he works for the factory but he's like he's almost like a, an employee out there in China for us nice so that's really cool we actually did have a full time employee out there in China he was a Chinese mm-hmm. national um, got his MBA from the states came from a super wealthy family didn't really care for like a traditional Chinese job um so he got connected to, with Dave, who was working on a few things, uh, but he he actually ended up passing away probably about a year or so ago at this point uh, from yeah. cancer. Yeah, oh, no. which I mean, obviously tragic. He was super nice. He made it yeah. going out there. It was like John's going to take care of you. John's going to take care of you. But yeah, having him pass away it was, oh, I and mean, he was nice. a friend, which is traumatic. But then also, it's like yeah, we don't have like someone contact, there. Yeah. yeah, we don't have someone there to translate. So we actually we did hire someone. Um, he's here. He's been trying to get out to China, but coronavirus has shut like everything oh, yeah. down. <laughs> That's had that whole another. But he lived in China layer. for a while. He speaks Chinese. Nice. Um, he is American, but he, yeah, he speaks Chinese. He worked for a, a company doing sourcing, like basically contract sourcing for other companies. Cool. So, so in the same vein, he knows he knows what he's doing. So having him out there will be awesome because nice. it's really going to pick up. Cool. Well, let's get rolling. Okay. Sounds good. This is the Extraordinary Podcast, and my guest today is Robbie Jenkins. <laughs> Rapid reboot. <laughs> it's called Rapid Reboot Robbie. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? A lot of ours. <laughs> Robbie at rapidreboot.com. Yeah. Thanks for uh, giving us a few minutes of your time, man. Yeah. I'm Where are glad. we and what are we doing? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, we're here in, in Linden, Utah. This is the headquarters for Rapid Reboot. Uh, and for those who don't know, let's uh, tell everybody a little bit about Rapid Reboot and what you guys do. Yeah, so Rapid Reboot, we do, it goes by a few names, IPC, Intermittent Pneumatic Compression, 
I like to call it dynamic compression, just kind of simplifies it. Uh, dynamic compression meaning that it's moving, uh, and we use pneumatic compression or air compression uh, through a device which attaches to what we call attachments, and inflatable garments. You put those on, and it's going to be cycling through sequential kind of gradient compression. Uh, what that really does, there, there are several benefits. There's improved circulation, just moving blood, moving lymphatic fluid, uh, which is one reason that it's it's distal to proximal, uh, which means that it works from your extremities towards your core as it's going through uh, cycles, essentially. Um, and that's moving lymphatic fluid up through the nodes, up to your core. Your body can really start filtering it out. Um, so that that's where the, the technology really started. One thing that makes Rapid Reboot different that, and that we really saw as the opportunity getting into the market was to offer more compression. Because a lot of devices, since they were coming from the medical space where they were treating things like lymphedema or venous insufficiency, they really didn't go beyond 100 mmHg. Uh, mmHg is millimeters of mercury, just a, a way of measuring pressure, so, right? For all you rednecks listening, yeah. <laughs> what he's saying is these are some sleeves that you can slide onto your legs and you pump an air hose to them and they blow up and they inflate and they pull all of the lactic acid and all the mm-hmm. ugly stuff that's in your legs out of there so that when you've done a long run or some long training, you get some speedy recovery. And it's based on the process of what you see like in hospital beds when you'll see those compressions on people's feet. And, or um, or on their lower legs, and it's making sure there are no blood clots form. So basically, it's a hyper turbo version of that. Yeah, it's just a more robust uh, version of that that you can use at home. You can use anywhere, really, I- anywhere as often as you need. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, it's just a much more quality at home version of that. But we really geared it towards sports medicine. So you have flushing out lactic acid, just getting old blood out new blood in faster than your body normally cycles out. And a lot of your, woods. your bigger clients or your customers are like personal trainers and yeah. like therapists and, and ones in that vein, like working for sports, uh, sports teams and stuff. Right. Yeah. So we, we do a lot direct to consumer for sure. And that, that market's definitely growing. So you have a lot of people, you know, whether they're weekend warriors or highly competitive doing triathletes. Yeah. Doing triathlons or, or you know, what, yeah. Endurance runners. Guys. But we also have a, a segment that is comprised of physical therapists. We do a lot with cryo places that offer kind of a a la carte recovery experience. We work with a lot of trainers for teams at the collegiate level, pro level, minor league level, um, across pretty much every sport imaginable. You're, and you guys just have now been making some plans for the Olympics, though, right? Yeah, so we we work with USA Weightlifting, we work with USA Climbing, uh, which is a a new thing. We work with USA Luge. Yeah, Climbing, this is their first year in the Olympics, right? Yeah, so that what's really cool about that, so they're actually based in Utah. Um, That's how we got connected with them, uh, talking to them. They do a lot of really actually uh, big events are going to be here in, in Utah this year. And so we saw it as an opportunity, us being still a relatively new company. We're only a little over three years old. This is this is our first Olympics. This yeah. is their first Olympics, and it what it does. It, we can showcase the versatility of the product, right? I mean, here here's a, a segment. There's a, lo- a lot of avid climbers out there, and the recovery industry hasn't really gone after that segment as much as they have, you know, like CrossFit or you know triathlon, marathon. Obviously, why do you think that is? Um. You know, I, I think it's not as big a market in, in their mind. That was um, my initial thought. Yeah, and and also, I I think just the um, perception of of climbers as people you know who live in their vans and are you know <laughs> doing it, <laughs> you know, don't Yosemite. have a job. Yeah, don't have a job hanging out in Yosemite. They're they're not going to pay for an expensive recovery product, sure, right? But certainly. whereas like your average marathon or your average triathlete are they're putting money in their sport. Their median income is going to be you know, yeah, higher. Yeah, it's a different demographic for yeah. sure. Traditionally. And, and yeah. I think some of that's definitely changing, especially as like 
sport and speed climbing events become more popular obviously the olympics is going to be a new stage for that um, climbing gyms are well, becoming i was gonna say really, the indoor climbing has really changed that dynamic i think yeah so people or it's can, changing it yeah it's, it's definitely changing that dynamic so those those people with high medium or median incomes you know or people just like people living in the city i mean yeah living in, yeah exactly in a in more of a high income areas based on you know availability you know because you think of rock climbing as well i mean that's kind of geographically specific yeah but now with that that's definitely evolving and changing a yeah lot. for sure and we climbers uh, i mean these are elite climbers are elite athletes and they're using the boots you know what we call our boots the leg sleeves the leg sleeves yeah those are the most popular as far as what's been seen right um, you know us and for, from us and our competitor. Well, and that's kind of how it all started, right? It all started with the boots, didn't it? Yeah. Um, so we do two other attachments, our hips and arms, and we've really been thinking, like, gosh, we – and those those are – the our hip and arm attachments completely – I mean, we went back to the drawing board with those. Those are designed from scratch. You almost have to, don't you? Yeah. And so we wanted to offer something better than was on the market. So, like I said, we went back to the drawing board and designed it from scratch, and we're like, man – our hip and arm attachments are hands down the best ones out there. That's all we've heard from everyone who's used them. Mm-hmm. We really need to showcase that instead of, you know, obviously we want to stick to our demographic of runners and triathletes who are going to be using the boots, but we really need to show that There's our more. other attachments are awesome. And so you think climbers, arms. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's so, the perfect. That's the perfect sport for that new aspect. It really goes hand in hand with the triathletes and the endurance guys yeah. because they're all such leg-based activities and now the climbing being such arm based i mean it's like yeah now you gotta find a hip based activity <laughs> yeah, i know right <laughs> does that look like salsa yeah. dancing <laughs> well yeah speed walking something like yeah that. <laughs> for sure cyclists crossfitters yeah, yeah. pretty yeah, pretty universal I, everyone loves the boots everyone loves the hips and we're like man you know arms are definitely underrated so yeah we wanted to highlight that plus there's an opportunity with usa climbing because as a u.s sport they're they're not they're up there for sure they're highly competitive but they're not like some of these other European countries where climbing's been around for you know for longer or like a more established sport, yeah, I mean. more established professional sports. So there's an opportunity if we can help USA get to the very top of the climbing scene in the world. This is the opportunity to kind of get on that ground floor. Well, yeah, and you, you kind of grow hand in hand, like mm-hmm. you you help each other out along the way. Tell me about how this all kind of got started. A Georgia boy ended up here out here in Utah. <laughs> yeah, so I ended up in Utah. <laughs> Yeah, I so was working in Salt Lake. Uh, my wife, well, at the time, my fiance was working for our now business partner. Um, his name is David Johnson. He's a shout out to Dave. Yeah, shout out to Dave. He's he's an engineer by trade, and he was doing a lot of triathlons. He needed recovery products, you know, and he really liked sitting in the Normatec boots. And why isn't one? Why isn't there more competition in this space? Why what, and why so are they so? Expensive. Yeah, why are they so expensive? Right, so. You know, being an engineer, he's like, I bet I could build, you know, I bet I could make one of these, right? <laughs> so, uh, so he, it was kind of a pet project for a while f- with him. And my wife was a, is a former collegiate pole vaulter, actually. Oh, nice. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah. So she, she uh, did track and field at Grand Canyon University in uh, Arizona. Awesome. And so she was familiar yeah. with you know, other, other brands out there. And he, he came to her and said, Hey, you know, I really want to get this going. I think there's an opportunity. Because there aren't a lot of people in this space, and people want this more accessible, right? So, yeah, I mean, she has a degree in web and graphic designs, and she's a very process uh, and operations-oriented person. So she really helped get that started. I quit my job in Salt Lake and came on came on board working from uh, Dave's basement, and I brought kind of the digital As I said, you, you're handling all the front end Yeah, of it. advertising, yeah. marketing. Because as good as they are at what they do, that yeah. was a missing piece of the puzzle that needed to be filled. Yeah, and, and Dave knows obviously a lot of the technical stuff on the engineering side, but he had been selling on Amazon. He had been doing a lot of business-related things, so we really came together as this awesome team to to build it from scratch and, and really just to, to bootstrap it. So that's how we got started. Um it opened up Pandora's box of FDA regulations, right? I mean, we knew it was a medical device, but maybe we thought, okay, you know, that's like an application or something like that. And the, the manufacturer we were working with, I'm mean, working really close. I mean, we've, 
we were there every step of the way in the development process. Um, they, they did some other medical devices, not directly related, but they knew about the FDA process and they're like, Hey, we can, you know, help you through that. We can help you through that. And we relied on them for a lot of it. And so we didn't see a lot of it, but as just, as we've got, as we've grown, you know, as we've had FDA audits, as we've. Yeah. Cause that's something you have to go through every year. Yeah, not and the that, and that's because these are literally medical grade devices, mm-hmm. and they and yeah. they have medical applications, and literally mm-hmm. like doctors can write prescriptions with these devices. Yeah, yeah, and to get over the counter is, I mean, that's a whole another ball game as far as passing um, safety standards, passing mm-hmm. you know efficacy standards. You know, you have to build a good product to get it through the FDA, right? And for sure, and right. you have to document everything that happens meetings that happens customer interactions that happens orders do you um, think that was the hardest part of the process um of coming to market no I mean, yeah i mean it's, three years you've been in business yeah it's i mean it's definitely the slowest it's it's not one of those where i mean one it's not it's not a simple product to begin with i mean there, there's a lot that, that goes yeah, a into lot of it. a lot of internal pieces there yeah a lot of internal <laughs> pieces yeah i mean it's electronic device it's it's got mechanical components right and we wanted to build something that was very quality and and with rapid reboot specifically we wanted to focus on the performance um the opportunity that of the device yeah of the device i mean the opportunity that we knew about going into market was okay norma tech caps off at this pressure everyone says they want more pressure is that something we can do i mean is that safe to do like we talked to a bunch of specialists we looked at research and we're like yeah we're, we can offer way more pressure, but it's not just the pressure. We need to do it faster. Like we need to be able to offer faster cycles. So that just meant more robust pieces. Basically, we just need to deliver better performance from the, the compressor itself. And so right. we, uh, yeah, we, that was our opportunity coming in into the market. Right. And, but it, because of that whole process, it's not, Oh, I have an idea for a product. I go find a, I go find a manufacturer, and then as soon as it comes off the line, I can start selling it. It's like no, I've got to, I've got to have a working pump to then send to testing to then go through months and months and months and months of, you know, it doesn't pass this standard process. or this, yeah. yeah. And then now now it's got to be put into an application that then is going to go sit on someone's desk for you know months on end, mm. you know, depending. So it it's. It's like having a really good idea and wanting to get to market and then having to wait forever for it actually to happen. That Which was probably terribly the frustrating, right? Like yeah, you, you know you've got this awesome product, and yeah. you know you got people that are dying to get their hands on it, and yet you still can't bring those two together yet. Yeah, and I mean, so we we didn't want to get out there too early before we could actually sell. But what, what we did before we launched in October of 2016, we actually did a f- several months of events with just prototypes. The prototypes that we had had into testing, essentially, and that we're going through the FDA process, it was like, let's just make sure that these are what we want to launch with, right? right? So people got a feel for them. Cause, yeah, because even if you did pass the FDA and all that, like, if the customer doesn't like them, if it doesn't do the job for them at the end of the day, then it doesn't matter, right? Like, yeah. you're still back at square one kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, and any significant changes kind of resets, not resets the process, but you basically, you have to document it. You have to submit that document. So let me ask you this. You you quit your job and your wife was already working here, mm-hmm. so y'all really put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah, I mean, so we, we kind of gambled on it. <laughs> what was was or was there an aha moment where you realized that this was just a thing, this is going to work? Like, I mean, that that gave you the confidence to then go quit your job. I mean, because well, that's a big step. Yeah, I I think it was. So I was working on it. Uh, behind the scenes yeah part-time well, yeah kind of part-time you know family business kind of thing yeah and when we started doing events where we were essentially showing them off but i'm still working full-time so yeah. two, 2016 st <laughs> george iron man first event we're showing them off event. yeah i take off early from work i drive down and people were loving them and they're you know they're asking like when are these going to be available and you know what's the price point we're telling them like what our plan is, but we're trying to sell the plan as, oh yeah, these are going to be this price point, right? And everyone's like, yeah, no, like get me on the list. And so we're building up an email list. People are going to email, and we're like, oh, like this is this is the opportunity that we thought was there, right? 
Because finally, someone shows up at, say, an Iron Man village with a good competitor to Norma Tech. Not, yeah. not that no one had ever tried, right? but no, these are, these are solid. And it's not just trying to copy Norma Tech. It's trying to deliver something else. Something better. Something, something better, right? Performance-wise. So when, and when we started doing like even local events, people were like, oh, that, those are like the Norma Techs, but better. That's what we wanted to hear, right? Yeah. And, you know, and, and they offer, obviously, Ding. yeah, great product. So They're less expensive, I Yeah, think. yeah. They're, they're, I, I get more for my money. I'm going to yeah. get more compression. I'm going to get more control. I'm going to get all these things. More for my money was, was kind of what I wanted the conversation to be as a marketing person, right? right? I didn't want it to be, oh, those are cheaper. Those are less expensive. I was just like, hey, you're going to get more for your money with this. That's a big difference it's a big difference especially as we as we added those the hip and arm attachments in our packages started getting a little more expensive but even then more more for your money more value than you know when you started adding norma tech attachments there i mean their packages were going up into the two thousand three thousand dollars and like all i did was add an arm attachment and now it's like eight hundred dollars more like what (laughs) what the heck you know i mean that that was obviously you know having a bunch of kids that I got to take care of with all their sports and all their activities. I mean, obviously cost was a big prohibitive thing for me from, mm-hmm. from taking that leap. So yeah. And, that and rapid rebuild, fill yeah. that gap. And it's, I think it's a product that's still kind of coming into its own as far as on, on the, the stage recovery has become a huge thing. It's a huge industry. It's growing by billions every year. People are recognizing how important it is. Yeah. It's been so underappreciated. The recovery aspect in general, whether it's mm-hmm. the, through the boots or through sleep or some of the, it seems like every time I turn around, there's new research talking about recovery. Yeah. And how critical it is. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things that, as a young person, I was, I was a little skeptical, right? Because it's like, I don't really need to. I can go. Yeah, because I bounce back. Yeah, I bounce back, right? Um, <laughs> but for an old guy like me, let me <laughs> yeah. tell you, brother, <laughs> that's a big difference. Yeah, but then like our Dave being a little older and doing a lot of triathlons and you know talking with a lot, of, doing a lot of the market research beforehand, it's like, yeah, this is something that people need. And there are a lot of products out there that do a lot of good, that, that serve a lot of needs. You know, you got your percussion massagers, your foam rollers, and every, everyone always asks us, you know, does this replace this? Or replace that it's like no but one thing that i that i i've come to really love about our product is you know obviously we're trying to position ourselves as one of those premium brands but it really is one of the most efficient and effective recovery tools out there and i, and I think that's because it, I mean, it's working from the physiological side it's helping with circulation and lymphatic function in a way that you know i mean percussion massages for example they they can definitely treat tight areas and, and they can help improve blood flow. And like they can do some of those things, but not to the degree as something that's 360 degrees exactly. around your leg that can, that can do, say, both your legs within 10 minutes and you're going to have all of these benefits as far as blood circulation and lymphatic function. And then with Rapid Reba, by adding that compression, we introduced essentially – an additional benefit of something that's going to basically a massage. People wanted the, you know, the compression boots to be massagers. And if it wasn't squeezing tight enough, it's like, this isn't really targeting those tight areas. Like I want, this isn't giving me really the mobility that I want. This isn't going to help with that myofascial release. If you get a tighter squeeze, but not as long, you can, you can really start giving those benefits. Right. So we introduced with rapid reboot. Yeah. Just, Basically, a tighter squeeze, so you can get some of that myofascial. Well, it release. gets the, the the whole entire squeeze too. But the thing that, from a user perspective, the user is passive with the the, the massagers and a lot of those other activities. The rolls, the yeah. user has to actively do something to get the result, or you got to have somebody else, a massager or a therapist or somebody yeah. applying those things to you. With these, it's a passive situation. You just sit down, turn on the television, whatever, just yeah. sit back, relax, and enjoy it. And I think. To, for me personally, that was one of the biggest aspects that I loved about it. It was the fact that it was such a passive yeah. situation, you know? Like, yeah, it's like it's the benefits of the active recovery because it's keeping fluid moving, right? But, but yeah, you're you not be, doing anything. Yeah, but you're not doing anything. <laughs> you get and, to sit there and enjoy. Yeah, and, and I've heard that from a number of people and, and some of our sponsored athletes too, you know, the athletes that we, that we work with regularly. Um, one of them, for example, Ben Hoffman, um, we did a, a video shoot with him last professional year. Professional triathlete. Yeah, professional triathlete. I mean, he's 
like a seven-time Ironman champion. Yeah, and he's one probably of, the best North American triathlete, I would say, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, Ben Ben got um, – he got fourth at Kona this past year. Yeah. He, he's top gotten American second. Again. Yeah, he's – He's been, you know, he, he's been in that top ten, you know, for a long time, and he's won South Africa. I don't know how many times, and you know, he's got his go-to races yeah, that he just dominates. Race. Yeah. Um. Anyway, he was. We were with him at his home in, in Tucson, where he trains during the winter, and um, we were at his house, you know, talking to his wife, and they were both saying, "It's like, okay, yeah, the, obviously the benefits of the product itself are awesome, but." She really likes it because when he gets back, you know, off a bike ride or, or you know, off a long run, he's in the boots. He's a captive audience, and so she gets to talk to him. Yeah, right? yeah. You know, they get to watch something together. The kids get to crawl on you. you yeah, know, you get to have all that. Yeah, yeah. It's... And and he started talking too about just the the aspect of okay, yeah, I, I can I can just chill. I don't have to do anything, but I still get that benefit. I get to maximize my time, optimize my time. I don't have to do anything. So so mentally, I can reset. Mentally, I can I can meditate or I can you know enjoy talking to my wife, and I don't have to feel guilty that I'm not putting in the time train. And he also was saying that you know, when you look at the training schedules of you know the top triathletes out there, probably like any athlete in any sport, you can take them. Their training is probably very very similar as far as the load Work that they're load, doing. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So then it becomes about what they're doing in between. You know, are two guys do. 12 mile ride, you know, or 12 mile run and one goes home and eats like crap or doesn't sleep, you know, or doesn't do the little things that the person who comes home focuses on the recovery, the stretching, the nutrition, the sleeping. He's going to have obviously the biggest advantage because he's going to get the most out of his training. Well, it's funny. You said you brought up that you, he uses it as a mental reset. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the first two times I wore him, I fell asleep. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> I completely like, I mean, middle of the day, just full on napping. I, and this was within, you know, like probably an hour after a pretty intense workout. And I'm literally, I fell asleep on the couch. So like that, that's a huge aspect that mental reset. I mean, that's probably one of the best for me. Again, me personally, one of the things I like the most about it is the fact that you do like, it's mm -hmm. a little meditative time. Yeah, it's for sure. Neat. So what was a failure that you learned the most from? Or do you have a favorite failure? Favorite failure? Hmm. An experience that you were able to, that you took something away from that made an impact. Oh my gosh. Because I think we tend to learn more mm -hmm. from our failures than our successes. Successes are wonderful and they feel good. And we do, and we can certainly learn some things. Uh, there's plenty to be learned from successes. But I yeah. think when we lose, when we get kicked in the teeth from time to time, when we fail at something, then we have to take a hard look at ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have to look at, okay, well, I came up short and there's something that I did or didn't do that caused that to happen. And so I, and I fail a lot. And so I'm always looking to those failures as like, what did I take away from that? What was an experience that I had? One recently was um, I tried to do a, or I was doing a 50K mm -hmm. um, trail run. And this was in December and it was last year. And it, the weather just rained the entire time. And eventually, the, I mean, it got to where the mud was about knee deep in certain places. And so mm -hmm. we all ended up quitting. None of us ended up making our goals. And, and I, I, mean, I came up short. But one of my buddies it went in, ended up doing two more laps than I did. And I, I was really bothered by the fact that I didn't stick it out and I didn't tough it out. So that was like a failure that I went back and reflected on and took a lot away from. I didn't meet my goal but then when I looked back on it, I was like, well, yeah, but I had so much fun hanging out with my friends. We all, none of us made our goals, but we took mm -hmm. some, we had some great experiences. We had some great meals. We shared in the misery together yeah. and it, and it kind of created that little bond and that little experience. So it was something that was, when I looked back, I was like, you know what, even though I didn't meet my race goal, it was a really great time. I had a really great experience. I learned a lot from that, even though I technically failed. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. Probably, I mean, if I, if I looked at a lot of experiences and really reflected to the mindset at the time, you know, what my mindset was at that time, uh, I'd probably be like, yeah, at the time I thought it was a failure, and now looking back, I feel like I'm in a good place at life, right? Um, great family, business is growing, so I don't feel like anything looking back really was a failure, but uh, I, I started off in product design, um, 
That was originally what brought me out from Georgia to, to Utah. And I thought for sure I'm going to be, you know, the product design. I, you know, I love the sketching, the engineering. And it was way more competitive than I anticipated. And not that I wasn't good. I was this 18-year-old kid coming out. And for the, the product design program uh, at BYU at the time was top in the nation. I mean, they had been the nice. top program, rated program, um, highly competitive. A lot of guys and a lot of people, a lot of girls and guys in the product design program uh, our first year. And, and they do, like, you, they basically cut people every year. I mean, you can be third year in the program and get cut. Whoa. It's, I mean, it was that cutthroat. And That's kind of the opposite of most schools. Most yeah. The longer you wait, the better chance you have of getting in. Kind of yeah. No, I mean, there, there were juniors who were waiting, to, like basically didn't make it into their senior year of the program. Wow. And your grades were all, you were ranked. Like your grade was basically your ranking in the class. Wow. So they did it on a curve. There's only like 20 people in the class. This is like, this is, Intro to product design. You, you had to apply to get in. Right. You already gone through a few. Yeah, you already jumped through a few ho- there. hoops just to get there. But you have people that are transferring from like animation, and so like they've got all the programs, all the software on they their computer. Know all that. Yeah. You know they're amazing sketchers. They're amazing. You know, come engineering background, and here I am. You know, son of an <laughs> English professor and middle school teacher and. He's like, all right. I mean, I could write circles around these people, but they can <laughs> draw circles around me. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I mean, I, and I, and I did all right. And I had a product yeah, I mean, design. You're a pretty smart dude anyway. So I mean, you're going <laughs> to fare pretty well in most general circles. Yeah. Well, it. so I, I left, I did an internship. I went, took a two year LDS mission, kind of a hiatus, really thought about things tried really practicing my sketching and everything. And I just didn't come back with the same passion that I had for it when I got into the program. And I wasn't really ready for the intensity. Well, I ended up transferring to communications, which is pretty much, it was like an open major. Yeah, like they're not gonna, generic, whatever. Yeah, they, they would talk about how, you know, you have to apply for the PR program and they only take so many people. And yeah, it is competitive. People didn't get in, sure. but... Um, for, Relatively speaking, to the yeah, for, for my program. skill sets, like versus the the more engineering and sketching side of like communications, PR, writing, that was a, more in my wheelhouse, and so the, for sure, it, it was it was definitely a better fit. I definitely felt better about it, but I definitely, for the longest time, I looked at myself as a failure from like the product yeah, side, right? Yeah, because that was the dream. That was yeah. why you came out here to begin with. So and I always sense. and I, and I love the design side of things. What's been really cool about Rapid Reboot. Not, not only do you wear a lot of hats, I've been able to wear that product design hat. Right? Yeah, right. And and do probably more so than you would. Yeah, and and feel like I and have the ownership over it too. Because yeah. if you had just gone down that path and gotten the degree and gotten some job working for you know say Apple or whatever Google, or something, yeah, then you would only have just been like the engineer. You'd just been one piece of that. Yeah, cog well, in that wheel, maybe. Yeah, I, I probably would have been stuck, like you know, designing Toto toilets or something. Yeah, you know, something, like yeah, something just <laughs> sketching medial, toilets every day. Yeah. That was my biggest fear that I would get stuck in the product <laughs> design. For I didn't want to toilets of all yeah, things. <laughs> I didn't want to design something stupid. I did learn some really cool things. I, I learned through the creative process, especially in my design internship, uh, which I kind of considered a, a failure. I thought I did some really cool things, but. I was that intern that they stuck in the corner and said, hey, here are the projects that we're probably never going to dedicate any full-time people to. to see what you come up with, yeah, right? Just, whatever. Yeah, you're getting paid next to nothing. Yeah. You know, you're, you're getting paid an experience. And I did get paid an experience. So I, I learned – so they gave me this project, and I'm trying to come up with ideas. And I'm, like, sketched out after an hour. I have no new ideas after an hour. And I'm like, oh, I, I can't, like – I can't go like, to my, in my boss right at the time and say, oh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And so for the next like three days, this is my first week. This is my first like, you know, real world internship, life, yeah. real, real world internship for this really um, awesome, the Gotham lighting, they're owned by Acuity oh. Brands. They're, they're in Atlanta. Sure. And I, like, I just sat at this, this paper for like the longest time. Like I have no, I so I just like sat in this cubicle out of the way. Complete afterthought, I felt, and I had no ideas, right? 
Well, then I started getting, I got one idea and I went down that path and I got another idea. And then uh, I eventually learned over the next like three weeks that there's always another idea. You know, you really have to look at it the new way, but like the creative process, sketching where it used to be my first year in the program, it used to be a homework assignment. You know, okay, I've got to sketch circles on, you know, 50 pages, you know, or 3D, 3D shapes. I've got to sketch this, got to sketch that. It's just an assignment. I just got to do it once, right? It really became a creative outlet of like, uh, oh, sketching is to get the ideas out of my head so that the new ideas can come in and I can put these two together. It's a shift in perspective. It was a shift in perspective. How did so you pull that off? Like, how did, what was the, mm. the mental shift that you make? And the reason why I ask about that is because so much about a lot of the things that I've done and, and some of the things that have happened to me over the past year has been about mindset. Yeah, and about perspective and like how you look at how you look at money, how you look at all, all these different aspects of things, relationships, mm -hmm. how you look at like obnoxious driver, for example. I mean, I'm a classic road rager because mm -hmm. I sat in rush hour traffic in Atlanta for all those yeah. years. Yeah, but now instead of thinking, well, that dude just cut me off. What a jerk! I'm going to pull up in front of him. I'm going to cut him off back. Whatever. Yeah. Now I think about it. Well, you know what? I wonder. I wonder what was going on with him that he's in such a hurry for i'll yeah. bet you know i'll bet he's probably like late to his daughter's soccer game or he's supposed to be like pick up you know and i start like just mm -hmm. and it, all it was, was just a simple shift mm -hmm. in my perspective and my thought about what the situation was and i've done it with with money in particular with finance it's really made i've tried to do a shift on thinking about like what money is important for mm -hmm. and like there's certain things about about money that we need and it's important but there's also some other stuff going on. We'll take a little break because we have a little friend in the house hanging out. <laughs> Your mom, the, the queen of the Jenkins clan, is here. Tell her to come in and say hi. <laughs> hey. How's it going? <laughs> You're on the podcast now. <laughs> All the way from Georgia. Who knew our pastor across in Utah? I hear that loud, obnoxious voice. I know that noise. <laughs> We're not live. We're recording, but okay. we'll, yeah. we'll keep it in there. Because <laughs> so I was sketching, and I had I was bone dry with ideas. You know, within an hour, of my first design gig, and I, you know, I I don't know necessarily where it came from, but like I needed to sketch something, so I just started forcing myself to sketch right. And that really started, that was like, oh, okay, that kind of looks cool. Like, whether it was unintentional or not. But like, Was it out of pure imagination or were you doing it like looking at something? Like anything for perspective or for um, inspiration or? Well, um, not really. So I uh, guess you had, some, you had some parameters for the project. Yeah, I had some parameters for the project. So basically what I was given, so it's a lighting company. And they did like big professional like office buildings. And a certain number of lights had to be on a backup, like an emergency backup system. Right, right. So if the power goes out, you can still see the lights to get out to the yeah. emergency exits, yada, yada. And so those backup lights were connected to, basically, it was a test button. It was a button that like goes on the wall, goes on the ceiling, goes somewhere, and it has a light plate ha housing over this big red glowing button. Right, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, they're typically on uh, fluorescent lights. Yeah, see them a lot. So it's a test button. So what I was told when they were give give it to me is like, okay, it has to you know t to meet certain standards. You know, it has to yeah, a visible red light, certain, certain things. things like that. It needs to be in a in a visible place, accessible place where someone can go up, you know, push the button, do the test. But they had gotten f some feedback from clients who were like, we design this multi-million dollar lobby or space and then there's this like stupid red glowing button over on the side right and so they're like we've never like really thought about it because you know this is what it is they across the industry the design, right yeah. like the, there's there is no design with this it's pure function right it's pure specs yeah I mean, and specs. so it was like if we could make it cooler what would that look like we don't know we've never thought about it Take it away. Gosh. I'm like, I'm redesigning this little glowing button on a light, <laughs> button, you know. And so, and I can't like overhaul the inst installation process, anything like right. that. So I'm like, I'm drawing light plate switches, like, with, <laughs> and with an hour, I'm done, right? right? Like, like, how many different ways can you draw a light switch? Yeah. I was like, oh, maybe it could be round. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, I just, you know, just force myself, like, 
because I had someone who was checking on me regularly, and I didn't want to show them a blank piece of paper. So I just started like drawing the same thing over and over again from different angles. Is really what what ended up happening. I was like, oh, that actually looks kind of cool. Like it's trying to draw it in perspective, but it it was a little off. It's like, oh, maybe it could have you know this bevel or this whatever, and. So it was thinking about things piece by piece, as simple as it was already. It you were was breaking it down even more. Breaking it down even more and, and saying, you know, what about this? What about that? Um, and so it really, it opened my eyes up into the design process and the creative process as a process. And something that you, you're not going to design it right the first way. It's impossible, right? Yeah. You can't get it right the first time. And that was one of my things, like growing up writing and being a fairly good writer and, and being critiqued by my dad, you know, and learning things from my dad as, as a writer. I, I thought, Oh, if I just write it well, the first time, if I could just get it perfect the first time, I hated the editing process. Yeah. Cause you want to be done. Right? Yeah. You yeah. want to be done. Right. You're a kid. You're and, like, and I, just, right I learned for something to be good. You have to go through that process because so true, right? you don't want to just want to come up with something and think that it's good. You have to know that cause you thought through it that, Oh, I'm going to encounter this problem or it can't be this way. It can't be that way. It should be this way. It, it can be better this way. And something else I learned too is, and one of the reasons I have right above my desk here, the sign that says simplify is that, for for things, especially complex things, some things that are really um, have a lot of components, taking everything piece by piece in in its simplest manner results in something that's really well put together, right? Thorough and really thorough, right? And that's something something can be simple and still complicated at the same time, right? Um, for example, like. Um, relationships or, or partnerships that we have with some athletes. We want to do all of these things. And sometimes I feel like I'm all over the map and I just force myself to simplify it. And I'm like, okay, we're, we're going to do these 10 things in this complex, you know, back and forth, this piece of marketing content or this ad, you know, these things we're going to, how they all inter way. interweave and how they all interact together for overall marketing plan. Yeah. But I'm going to do, I'm just going to do this piece. I just need to, I just need to figure out, the date. When are we going to do this shoot? You know, for example, right, right. That who's one... going to be involved? And, and and actually, my team is really good with that, um, pushing me to be even better with that. Because you can have an idea for really cool, yeah, like a video that you want to do with an athlete, right? I really, oh, really want to capture their story. And then <coughs> we sit down together, and it's like I can see it in my mind. But then you have to material like materialize it. It seems so simple in your mind, then you start breaking it down and it's really complex, but then if you break it down beyond that and take each thing piece by piece, then it's like, okay, I can figure out when we're going to do it. I can figure out who needs to be in and I need I can I can figure out, okay, this shot, this shot, that shot. And I'm trying to get I am getting better at it and again, my team's really helping me with that, but yeah. things like that, even like contracts with organizations, like what is this going to look like? It seems it really seems muddled and complex on the outside. Then you start really breaking it down. It really simplifies it, and it allows. If I only have to be creative within a small parameter, it's easier for me because I don't have to worry about this thing or that thing. Um, I don't have to nail it the first time. I guess. Well, it's so funny because we we we're kind of have the same issue, but from the exact opposite perspective. So, like for me, being a general contractor and always being very mechanical and hands-on and stuff like so I, I get that part of it but then trying to do the writing and yeah. trying to get in that flow state it's like well the only way that I can do that is I just have to write yeah. or and even so like he's talking about break it down make it simple well I would say okay well I just need to write well then I would go and I couldn't write and I would nothing was coming to me so then I broke it down even further so okay for you have one hour okay for this one hour you're either going to write or you're going to sit there Mm -hmm. You're not going to do anything else, but like you break it down to its simplest, simplest denominator and then take those little, there's one little step, and one little thing, and then it starts to, it's yeah. amazing how the process starts to reveal itself at that point. But yeah. getting to that point, it's so hard, like yeah. breaking it down to make it simple. It, it goes back to like, how do you run a marathon? The idea of running 26 miles, that's a lot for somebody to wrap their head around. But if you can just say, well, I'm just going to run to that light post, well, I, or I'm just going to walk to that light post if that's as far as I can get, you know, yeah. I can go as far as I need. Like, I know I can get to that light post. You know, it's only 20 feet. Yeah. yeah I don't know if I can get 26 miles, but I know, I, or again, breaking it down even simple, I know I can take that next step. Yeah. And it's like, how do you run a marathon? One step at a time. Yeah. You know. 
And then it, here's another example related to Rapid Reboot specifically. So early on, I'm I'm still as the marketing person. I'm still really. I'm trying to go back to every intro to PR marketing class that I took. <laughs> it's like define your demographics, yeah. and so I'm like, oh, you know, we could work with this board and this board and this board. And I'm trying not to let my mind like go too crazy and chase every opportunity that comes up because you know we had athletes in diff- like a lot of sports and sports I want to work with. Yeah, um, sports that appeal to you. Yeah, sports that appeal. Reach out and it's like, oh man, we could work with them, but. Then you start looking at it. It's like, okay, if we're going to sponsor them, it's going to be this much, and we're brand new as a company. Like that money could go to more inventory. That money could go to another Ironman event where we know we can sell. Yeah, right. Where the, so, the ROI will be a lot. Yeah. Higher so I, I wanted or immediate. I really had to get myself to focus on the, on our core demographics, but it was still there were still failures along the way. Um, one one being Spartan races. Spartan races are super fun. For our type of product, and we thought, oh man, we're gonna access to these people. You know, our competitors aren't doing it. It's you know, a good like, demographic fit. Yeah, like in from theory. from the outside, it was like, oh, this is gonna be awesome. So we we show up. We did two of them, and we bought the booth space. And you know, the the Spartan organization is really trying to you know get us hooked and hoping that we have a good experience. So like we're we're being treated in a way that we hadn't been treated with other like races, marathons triathlete or triathlons and so um we were like oh this could be really cool we we could get in as a young company spartan races are getting big and and they they were definitely fun but as far as from an exhibition standpoint they were the absolute worst because these muddy people came <laughs> and got in our expensive equipment, <laughs> trashed <and> it, <laughs> trashed them. I mean, we're, they clean up really nicely. We really pride ourselves on quality. <laughs> but yeah, the, like, so we did. We did one outside of Sacramento and the one outside of um, L.A., like Castilla oh, okay. Lake or Castilla Lake. Okay. Lake. Uh, I'm not from Southern L.A., so I don't really know that well. But there's a there's a big lake not too far out of uh, the L.A suburban area and really well attended super fun the race organizer told us we could hop in when we wanted so like you know being a an active person it's like yeah i'll, I'll hop in the... these spartan races it, it yeah. was cool it was fun yeah, and fun yeah sure but we realized i mean the first one was like oh man this is not what we and we're cleaning the stuff and like this is not <laughs> what we anticipated we, and we were already signed up for the second one and we went straight from the first one to the second one like Okay, we're never doing yeah, this, this again. This is not going to work. <laughs> so, we, I mean, we we still we figured, okay, if we could get in with their Spartan team, right, yeah, or their pro yeah. team, uh-huh. if we do kind of a, we'll sponsor you, but we're not going to show up and set up our stuff in the mud. <laughs> yeah. Right? Right. Not conducive. Put our chairs in the mud, put our expensive stuff yeah, in the mud. Yeah, not this expensive stuff, man. Yeah, so it was just, it was cool. We made some really cool connections. We We had people who bought and, you know, who we still follow and, you know, we're still kind of in rapid reboot diehards, which which is cool. It's it's not that we're not in that community, and right, and it's not that it's it's, it's just that doesn't work for what you're trying to yeah, do. Yeah, we, we tried to take <laughs> as a okay, poor business model. <laughs> yeah, here's our marathon setup. Here's our triathlon setup. It's just gonna work magically in Spartan races. Right, didn't plug and play quite like you thought. Fail. So really, now I mean, that was a huge learning experience because now every time someone comes to us with a new event idea, right, like hey come exhibit with us at our event. It's like, okay, is it core demographic? Do we know we're going to make our money back? Right. Um, it takes time and money. Is that, could that better be spent? Like, I know we do a lot of triathlons, but what if we just signed up for another triathlon and we could... Or use it in other spaces, like other marketing yeah. spaces, like whether it's social yeah. media or otherwise. We're I mean, a little more tried and true. So, yeah, we want to experiment. We want to kind of see what markets, like climbing, um, fighting has been a huge one. We we did something with uh, Anthony Pettis. Oh, nice. Which, I mean, going in with Spartan in the back of my mind, like, <laughs> Sweaty oh, man, boxers. are we in the right space? Yeah, like, it does. it's not really traditional as far as what we know about this space and this kind of recovery product. And, you know, Norma Tech hasn't really done that many things. Or, you know, some of the other brands weren't really in the space. And so... Is it because they tried it and they failed, right? But it ended up being being awesome, but not at the same time. It's like, okay, we can do a little bit in this space and grow it while not losing our core demographic right. and growing. If we're still growing in a space, 
like marathon and triathlon is like let's grow really really solidly there and then whatever opportunities come along yeah we can kind of grow outside of that but i don't want to blow fifty thousand dollars chasing spartan races to make you know fifty thousand back when we could have spent that money doing triathlon and made you know three to four or five you know who, yeah who knows how much right back. it's all about that roi it's all about day. the roi and, and you got knowing you... knowing your business model what's going to translate well and and experimenting in a way that's not going to detract from what your your core is from a marketing standpoint being an entrepreneur and starting a small business is scary in my opinion it's very very scary for me doing what i'm doing and going down this path has been quite honestly terrifying at times it's been terribly rewarding and i've loved it but yeah. there's a lot of times where it's really really scary what's the most scared you've been or have you had a scary moment in this on this journey yeah so well Having kids, <laughs> yeah, and, ha- and having so much of the business. I mean, and we, we should bring up the fact that you are a new dad for the second time here within the last month or so. Number yeah, two. So just had number two, girl number Added two. Added to the equation. Yeah, and, and my wife and I work in the business, on the business, all the time. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's a our, family business now. It's a family <laughs> business in more ways than one. We've we've hired siblings, we've hired cousins. We've, well, and I had to make space with a little bouncer <laughs> yeah. chair over here in the office to find some space to sit up. Yeah, and I, I mean, uh, and I think we have a pretty professional organization, but it still feels very, uh, very start like very new, right? It's yeah. still our baby, and and yeah. it, it, it still is relatively new, right? Like three years old is still an infant, and in, even in startup space. But probably the the scariest I think is well I mean like you said earlier we put all our eggs in one basket right and so I mean if not that I'm not employable right I I mean I have a, a master's degree my wife has a fast bachelor's degree in web and graphic design she's really good at it she's done freelance stuff with it I mean until Rapid Reboot started really taking off and consuming all our time but. It's like, yeah, if this if this failed, we would be unemployed, and we both have to try to find jobs, right? Um, and what also is scary too is we're, I mean, we're trying to grow this thing, so we're taking, like, our salary is basically just to get us by. Yeah, just right? enough to pay the bills. Yeah, until we can grow Rapid Reboot to a point where it's we we've released what we've wanted to you know we, we have some really ambitious projects that's the going thing is on you've right got now. so much stuff going on that you're having to just put everything yeah into making it happen you're not taking outside investments you're i mean this is yeah this it's it's the whole process is pretty terrifying yeah right? the so whole all our adventure. r&d and and everything that's going on right now and, and i can't i don't want to go too much into it but we have some really cool stuff coming out that's really going to take us from maybe like a five to 10 year company to being a 15, 20, you know, who knows how long the company could be around to get to that whole other level of viability from a product standpoint and a reputation standpoint. So we're going to get there. And if we, if we had just wanted to be a product company, we could be making a ton. Right. Right. But we wanted rapid reboot to be more than that. And we wanted it to be viable for longer. Right. And and that was what's really cool about the, the ownership, you know, my wife and I owning, equity stake and our, our business partners like we've had that same goal it's like we're not going to just take everything out of rapid reboot so we can go buy boats and everything like that I'm right because that's not what it's about I mean, yeah especially so not right now we'd rather hire engineers and hire more customer service people so that we can treat people right because that because that's going to get you a bigger boat yeah that's going to get us <laughs> yeah it's in the long run it's going to mean yeah in the long it's going to mean rapid reboots around for longer yeah and it's bigger than it otherwise could be instead of being you know worth 10 million we could be worth you know who knows how much right so uh, what's scary about that now is my wife and i like we just bought a house we, like we're we're growing up we we need yeah. our own life place. is continuing to cycle yeah <laughs> we we needed two cars we and it's like how are we going to do this taking like nothing out of the business right i mean and i, I say nothing but taking very little like making right. <laughs> making less than people with my degrees do for their first job like straight out of college right? yeah, it's like, right. or like or like when you're paying your some of your employees more than you're getting paid kind oh, of thing yeah, i've paying been like all of, yeah paying, paying our employees and and we would i mean we're in a position where we would rather yeah like Let's pay the people who are worth it, what they're worth. I mean, as as best we can, right? Um, but yeah, it, it is hard. It, it's hard bringing on people and like you know what, like 
people on the outside would say, oh, you know, as one of the owners, you're probably, you're making this much and this person making that. And it's like, in reality, it's like, who's the cheapest employee? It's yeah, the owners. Exactly. <laughs> so, well, and being the owners, I mean, you're just last on the totem pole. Yeah. Everybody else, you've got to get everybody else taken care of first. And then yeah. if there's something left, then you get yeah. to take care of yourself. Because you need them and you, and you want yeah. them and, it, and it's fun. And, and I will say it's cool to have a successful business because even though we're still biding our time from the investment standpoint, right? It's still like it does really cool things. Like, well, yeah, you've got something that works. You got, we have you've something got, that works. Yeah, uh, a, a thing, man. That's mm-hmm. like if you can just, yeah, take care of it and nurture it and do it. Well, you know, yeah, mold it, shape it, and treat it right. It'll really yeah. pay off in the long run. Yeah, and I and I love to travel and I love sports and this allows me to do both. Like, yeah, you know, to go to New York to do a photo shoot with an athlete. I love stuff like that. Yeah, it's kind of like living the dream, right? A yeah, bit. you know, to to be able to like go to Florida and have my parents come down and hang out at the beach, bring our kids, they get to see them, but then also like we're working at the same time, we get to combine those things. So we go on some cool trips, traveled internationally with it, traveled all over the U.S. I was with say, it. Well, it allows you to to travel and experience things. Yeah, in, but in to have a purpose life. purpose behind it, and it to be an investment, and to be to be building something, right? And to not just be Creating. like, I don't, I, I would much rather have a, an adventure than a vacation. So it's like, I'm not just going to go sit on a beach with nothing for the next few days. It's like, I get to go to a cool place and I, and I also get to actively try to build something and, and create. And I mean, it's stressful at times too, right? It feels like, Oh, I, I went to this really cool place and I didn't get, you know, to do everything that I wanted because I was right. busy, you know, meeting with this factory or meeting with this athlete or whatever it may be. But at the same time, I, I still got to go to that place and I still got to, I got to work and have fun at the same time. It's, it's really cool. I, I mentioned this earlier at lunch, but I call it the back door into sports, like to be able to go into, I've been in, you know, protein locker rooms with this. I've been, you know, talked to, to trainers. I've talked to athletes and, and a myriad of sports. That's, that's really cool to me. So it, there's definitely the stress of, you know, the risk as one of the owners, right? Not pulling out a ton of money from it, right? Or not, you know, not pulling out money from it other than, you know, meager salary. It's, there's definitely stress and risk with it, right? Especially, yeah, having baby number two, now they're medical bills and we're paying everything out of pocket because we're business owners and yeah, buying our house as a all business the owner. and all those backup plans that a lot of yeah. normal jobs have. Yeah, and trying to trying to buy a house and they're like, wait, your salary is that, but then you also have this and they're looking at the business and they're yeah. like, it was a, it was a painful process to going through like the house buying stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we're like, okay, even Not though the company's doing this well, this is what we have to buy a house with. And so, anyway. And then they look at you funny. It, yeah. It doesn't compute because it's not the normal average every day. Yeah. They and see I don't get a W-2 doing. from somebody, right. you know, that says you make 80K a yeah. year. And so... Huh. Anyway. What's one thing that you do, like a habit, that most other people don't do that you think has contributed to some of your success? Huh. Well. Or do you have any routines, morning or evening in particular? You know, I used to be a lot better about that. I'm... Kids definitely throw everything off center, right? <laughs> well, and, and a one month old really throws oh, everything man. into pure chaos. So yeah. maybe six months ago, <laughs> yeah. Well, like, was there an average routine or a habit that you used yeah. on a regular basis? So we we had our first, and it took us two years to get into a routine of okay, they go to bed at eight thirty, and from eight thirty to eleven, that's our get stuff done time, or you know, be together time. You know, to sit down, talk about finances, or sit down to like do this project in the house tile the backsplash in our kitchen right to like get in a routine of getting things done or yeah. or just taking the evening off and then all comes number two right and it's like okay we got number one down to bed and it used to be from 8 30 to 11 that was our time <laughs> nope anymore. now it's 8 8 30 to 1 a.m is baby number two's party time so um uh, one, one thing great. that i that i've always done this, this might be kind of funny i don't know if, and i can't speak to other people so maybe, maybe there are people out there but I, I've always taken what I call power showers. Like I, I I could be in the shower for an hour and it it could feel like 
a minute. I mean, just like really? completely lose my mind in the shower thinking about, I mean, I came up with the name Rapid Reboot in the shower. It's um, your meditative time. It's, it's my meditation time. And, Interesting. And I've always been someone who really likes my, my not, I won't call it meditation, but my my in my mind time yeah your alone thoughts time yeah and my my uh, my wife always knows she's like you're lost in your head again right um and so i when i have the time like if i'm on a trip and i'm not with kids or i i could just stand in the shower for for an hour like i said and until and not be aware of anything until the water starts going cold as you say you better get you one of those tankless water heaters yeah i know right <laughs> <laughs> and just and just think about things, right? Um, yeah. Especially I love that. any of the design projects that I had, right? Like trying to come up with a name for Rapid Reboot, right? Naming anything, like even naming kids, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's just yeah. like, what names do I like? Okay, you know. And, and I haven't had that as much lately, obviously, because I don't want to, you know, leave my my wife hanging <laughs> to right. two kids while I'm just, you know. <laughs> Sleeping in the shower. <laughs> yeah, but... Um, it's it's something that I've always like. It's, That's a great answer. Pro- probably some some of my best ideas for anything, really. You know, as stupid as they may be, you know, from a, a broader level, it, it kind of happened in the shower. There's there's just like a not not a trance like effect, but just warm water. I can just be there. E- even now. Where I'm trying not to take a long shower, it's like okay, I'm just gonna hop in, hop out. I feel like I hop in, hop out, and it's like it's 15 minutes later, and it's like wait, I just took a two minute shower right, right. in my mind, right? It feels so fast when because you're in that state, yeah, because you're, you're in that state. Then. So it, you know, thinking through a lot, a lot of things, you know, whether personal or or for the company, right? Yeah, I, I would every night. I would love to have the time to do an hour sh- shower, right? Because then it's. I mean, whether I'm you know, trying to come up with yeah, what's like what's the video idea you yeah. know for this or what's app a marketing that, strategy yeah marketing or, strategy yeah. who am I going to add do this ad with their, you know, yeah, all the millions like, of those things yeah like you know how are ads performing online right okay what what can I do what's what's the messaging what's the messaging and okay you know just going back to that or core demographics or yeah we get athletes and agents reaching out to us all the time and it's kind of hard to know like we have this pretty rudimentary process for for uh, vetting them i guess where okay what's their credibility slash what's their visibility right we'll, we'll work with influencers who are highly visible and maybe they're just you know a mommy runner or, uh, um, and then we'll work with this highly credible athlete who might only have a few thousand followers on social media but those thousand you know or a few thousand people know who they are because they're the top of their their class in whatever sport right um there's some ultra marathoners like that, right? Mm-hmm. They reach out and it's like, okay, no one outside of ultra marathon knows who you are. Right. But if you're an ultra marathon, you know who that, you know, you know who Camille Heron is, you know who Hayden Hawks is, right? Mm-hmm. Like they're top of the top, some of the best in the world. So they don't have that visibility from that initial perspective. Anyway, so we have that process of trying to vet them but every situation is different you know some people come along they have a million followers and they're really credible and they're going to do stuff you know just if we can get them some product and work with them in some cool ways it's like yeah don't worry about paying me right and others like they're going to come and you know spend money on me i want to be a sponsored athlete and you know we'd love to work with every athlete but that's not possible right, and so sure. you know to sit in the shower and be like okay this person, well, what could we do? How we're we going to utilize? Visualize how they'll fit within the role. Yeah, are, the, are they worth it? What's the ROI? Yeah, okay, yes or no? Like to make all those decisions. For me, if I had it my way, would just be in the shower. That's great. I love that you say that. I've actually been reading this book. It's called the The Power of the Subconscious Mind. And I actually just brought it with me on this trip. It's Joseph Murray. Okay, but um, he talks about how you access that subconscious and and a lot of his stuff is obviously based around doing it in the morning and the evening and some type of a meditative thing mm-hmm. but it's exactly the process of what you're talking about what you do in the shower mm-hmm. it's uh, that's what you're doing you're according to this book anyway you're accessing that power of that subconscious and what that subconscious is able to do for you like the, what the answers it's already given you to me that is just crazy weird how that works yeah 
and you see you see like float spas coming on. You see a lot of places where I mean, we even work with like the deprivation of, chambers or whatever. Yeah, deprivation <laughs> chambers. You see a lot of places like recovery oriented places that'll use our boots and they'll put people in a zero gravity chair, you know, put give them the right music, you know, give them masks so it's completely dark, like put them in a meditative trance, right? You're taking care of their body and everything. And I think, yeah, the shower is a quick and easy way to do that because you know, it's just the warm water. It's just well, yeah, and the, the, the noise of the mix. I mean, all, I mean, think about it. I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah it makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, it's just white noise. Yeah, just white noise. Completely yeah. zone out and get lost in your thoughts and start start figuring things out. Yeah. It's, That's a great answer to that question. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the best answers I've ever gotten for that question, actually. Really? I, I think that's, that's <laughs> funny because when you're you know, living in a dorm with five other guys or, you know, in a, in a house yeah. in college with three other guys, yeah. you can't take an hour shower. Cause, yeah. You know, this guy's got to get to this, you know, his, his date, this, yeah. you know, they kind of hate you to be in the shower for so long. So. Right. But anyway, that's great. So I just talked about the book. I mean, um, any book that you're, well, let me ask you this. Do you have a favorite book? Fiction or otherwise? You know, I... Or maybe a book you've given away more than others? Maybe it made an impact on you? Well, I mean, I, I don't want it to be cliche, but Shoe Dog has probably... Within the past couple of years, Shoe Dog has probably been the most impactful. No kidding. No, we were just talking about that earlier with Brian. Yeah, and, and David recommended it to me a while ago, and I'm like, and yeah, yeah, yeah. For those who don't know, it's the story of Nike. Yeah, the story of Nike, Phil Knight. Um, and it's one of those that comes up all the time. Like a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people find it influential. And, and like I said, I, I'm not really good about reading self-help books. Not that it's a self-help book, but it's it's more of a biographical. It's an yeah. autobiography, right? Right. And in the same vein of not being good with self-help books, I'm not really great about reading other people's stories, right? The biographies or autobiographies. Huh. Um, so I, I at first put it off and then I read it and I'm like, Oh, okay. Now I understand. Yeah. Now I understand why everyone likes it. I understand why Dave was recommending it to me right. and I recommended it to my wife and she read it and she's like, yeah, hundred percent relate, you know, to a lot. Cause he just, he captures them in a very simple way and in, in the story and he doesn't over exaggerate them. He doesn't, he doesn't try to build himself up into like, from the get go, it's not like I built Nike. Here's my story. It's like it was a very authentic, real look at this. Uh, and that trials. really hits home, doesn't it? When it's real like that, as opposed yeah. to all pompous and yeah. And, and I know a lot of people who have started a business. So I'm not, this isn't unique to me. You know. But you feel like you have that relationship with Phil, and you and you can see what he was able to build. But then to take a step back and okay, you know, in the seventies, he's like going and begging to banks uh, which fortunately we haven't had to do but then he's going home and he's eating what like beef stroganoff I think is what he said like every night for a week and that's what his wife would make and it's like okay I can relate to that I can relate to feeling like man like we don't even have the money to you know go buy a nice meal um, and we have this business that is it's growing but it's consuming everything that like could be ours or you know or partially yeah. ours right so it's but and then to see you know him stick with it and you know, to get some breaks, and, uh, especially for us at Rapid Review, like working with athletes, you know, to see how they started working with athletes and, and the breaks that they got with you know, like pre and you know, obviously later with Nike Jordan. Mm -hmm. So it's like, all right, yeah, Jordan. Yeah, to to be working with athletes and feel like, all right, like we're we're gonna. Who's gonna be my Jordan? You know, yeah. Who's gonna be? <laughs> you know, we, we work with some um, amazing athletes, and uh, already we, we work with athletes. It's like, I mean, they could they could make it huge this year. I mean, right? And well, it's we, kind of like with me with this podcast. It's like you're getting the opportunity to meet and associate with people that you want to meet and associate with. You want to yeah. be with these leaders, these professionals, these high quality individuals, and this job has provided you a conduit to be able to do that and that's it's been the exact same experience for me with the podcast it's like if you told me two years ago that'd be sitting with brian beck said from ultra shoes i'd be like you're crazy you know yeah who would have thought in a million years you know but it's like again if you're taking all those little bitty steps along the way and you just keep plugging along you keep going after those athletes then it's all gonna come together 
yeah. can't fail, in my opinion. <laughs> like, I just, I, it just seems like it's destiny. Yeah. Hey, y'all. Thanks for listening. So, what'd you think? What did I miss? Was there a topic you wish we had covered? Was there an area of discussion you want to know more about? Or was the whole thing just too long? Please, send us your questions and feedback on social media to at Extraordinary Podcast or check out our website, extraordinarypodcast.net. Subscribe there for all the latest episodes, blog posts, and more. And if you're tired of living the same old ordinary life, shoot me an email, nate at extraordinarypodcast.net, and I will send you your own customizable blueprint that will walk you through step-by-step how to create your own extraordinary life. And if you or someone you know already fits the profile, you can submit a request to be interviewed on the website as well. Finally, if you like what you heard or learned today, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and follow the Extraordinary Podcast on all your favorite platforms like YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes. And if you feel inspired, show your support for the show by donating through Patreon. It is through this financial support that we are able to continue to bring to life ordinary people living extraordinary lives. Thank you for your support, and most of all, just being you. This is Nate G, and we'll see you next week.